saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Father in heaven, I count it a great privilege to join with brothers and sisters from Kenya and probably many parts of the world, and that they have um, invited me to participate in this great endeavor to share this message. And I ask, Father, that you will please give your Holy Spirit that our meeting can be um, it can be just what you want it to be, Father, that you will be able to speak to hearts and that you will inspire and encourage us and that you will help us. And so, Father, help all the technical issues to work well, help our internet connections to work and hold up well, the application to work well, and give us, Father, grace, for we know that we are needful and that you are able to supply and to save to the uttermost. So we thank you, Father. We ask your sweet blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, I'd like to uh, thank Brother Sammy and the others who have invited me to be with you for these sessions this week. I, I really look forward to them. I'm just a little new to Zoom, so you'll excuse me if I have a little... Um, challenge trying to figure out how to do everything, but I want to screen share so that you can see my uh, slides and I'm hoping that those are there. And could I get a confirmation, Sammy, that you all are able to see this slide? Yes, we can see them. Okay, is that big enough about right or should it be bigger, smaller? Uh, that is big enough. That's big enough. Okay, very good. I'll just try to work it like this. Our topic today is evangelism and church planting. And I think this is one of the greatest topics I could have been given. I'm really thankful for it. In one sense, it may be one of the easiest topics to, to discuss and to study on because there is just so much information and inspiration on this subject. But it's also maybe one of the more difficult because of the very fact that there is so much information that we have to try to narrow it down and to put it all within one presentation. That's not so easy either. But evangelism focuses on proclaiming the good news of the coming kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. It is so comprehensive. It includes uh, repentance, forgiveness of sins, the hope of eternal life. All this happens through the death of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, his high priestly ministry. Ellen White laid it out very simply like this. She said, evangelistic work, opening the scriptures to others, warning men and women of what is coming upon the world, is to occupy more and still more of the time of God's servants. That's the Review and Herald of August 2, 1906, paragraph 13. So the most fundamental thing that we do in evangelism is we open the scriptures but remember, as Jesus said, these are they which spoke of me or speak of me. When we open the scriptures, we're opening Jesus to people and the knowledge of his saving grace. But evangelism, even in its name, if we actually look at the name evangelistic or evangelism, uh, evangelical, it goes back to a Greek word that fundamentally means good news, or in this case, the proclamation of good news. And we have been all, as Christians, given a commission. In John chapter 20 and verse 21, then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Jesus sends us, and he doesn't send us just to a little corner in the world. He doesn't send us only to Kenya or just to Africa or here just to the United States or in my little community. In Mark chapter 16 and verses 15 and 16, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. 
Jesus gives us a commission here to go to the world. Now, this is the commission as given in Mark, but probably the most famous commission or the one that we're most familiar with is found in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. And there it says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. And I'm sure we've discussed in times past what that means. We're not denying as part of the scripture, but what does that mean? How do we understand it? But that's for another day. But then verse 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. So Jesus tells us here that we are to go, and we are to teach all nations. And he's given us a promise to be with us. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. But friends, remember this, that there, there has to be a go for there to be a low. Did you get that? There has to be a go before there is low. He says, law, I'm with you always. But before he promises that, he gives us a condition, and that is that we are to go and that we are to share this message. Now, as probably most of you know, there's been a book published uh, by the Adventist Church entitled Evangelism. And you may be familiar with one particular section of this book, on misrepresentations of the Godhead, I believe it's called, starting in around page 600 and so. And we may have to consider some of those statements in some future day, but there is a lot of really helpful information in this book, and it's been categorized for you. And most of it is, it's all really good. It's just a matter of understanding it in context at times. But in evangelism on page 152, this was a, from a manuscript Ellen White wrote in uh, 1903, manuscript 24, she says to this, to us also the commission is given. We are bidden to go forth as Christ's messengers to teach, instruct, and persuade men and women to urge upon their attention the word of life. And to us also the assurance of Christ's abiding presence is given. Whatever the difficulties with which we may have to contend, whatever the trials we may have to endure, the gracious promise is always ours. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And of course, that's based, of course, upon the condition that we are to go. And then also in evangelism on page 15 in paragraph 3, it says, the disciples were to teach what Christ had taught. He said, you go and you teach, but here's what you're to teach. You're to teach what Jesus taught. She continues, that which he had spoken, not only in person, but through all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament is here included. Because, let me just pause, because remember in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, Peter says it was the spirit of Christ that was speaking through those prophets. And so these were the teachings of Christ in the prophets. Continuing in our reference, it says, human teachings is shut out. There is no place for tradition, for man's theories and conclusions, or for church legislation. No laws ordained by ecclesiastical authorities are included in the commission. None of these are Christ's servants to teach. The law and the prophets, with the record of his own words and deeds, are the treasure committed to the disciples to be given to the world. We of all people know that God has prophetically spoken of a special people that are go forth in all the world, and we call this the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. I won't take time to read those now. I think that we're all very familiar with those messages. But the first message begins with the fact that we are living in the judgment hour message and to worship God as the great creator of all things, including the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath. The second angel's message warns us about the fall of Babylon. And the third angel's message is a warning against receiving the mark of the beast. 
We are told in volume six of the testimonies on page 11 and paragraph one, a great work is to be accomplished in setting before men the saving truths of the gospel. This is the means ordained by God to stem the tide of moral corruption. This is his means of restoring his moral image in man. It is his remedy for universal disorganization. It is the power that draws men together in unity. To present these truths is the work of the third angel's message. The Lord designs that the great presentation of this message shall be the highest, greatest work carried on in the world at this time. Recently in, in the United States, we had an election and we elected a new president. I'm sure most of you have heard some of this news and he has an agenda, an agenda probably different than the prior president and they want to accomplish this work or they want to accomplish that work, but the highest and the greatest work that can be done is the giving of the three angels messages at this time. And that is something, brothers and sisters, God has called each one of us to have a part in every one of us. Now, what will happen? What will happen if we don't go, if we don't share this message? I would invite you to read with me Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. There Paul says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And, and I'm just so thankful for that text, and I, and I hope you are too, that as we share the good news with others, that they can be saved. But he says in verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Here Paul's quoting from Isaiah 52 and verse 7. And he says that they, they can't believe unless they hear. And how can they hear without a preacher? And so, yes, we have this formal gift of pastors. But friends, we all are heralds. We're all preachers in one way or another. We're preachers of righteousness. This is men and women both. And I just heard um, something that sounded like we lost a connection. Are we still connected, Brother Sammy? Is everything okay still? Yeah, we are still connected. Okay, thank you. So God has given us a call. God has given us a call. My question is, what should be our response? I think of Isaiah. God was looking for someone to send. And, in, and he said, who, who will go for us? Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 6. There Isaiah. It says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. When I was a lot younger, um, in fact, when I was 21 years old, I received a call to the gospel ministry. And in the last 42 years, I've accounted it the greatest privilege to be involved in the work of God. And God said, would you go? And I said, yes, I will go. And sometimes, friends, we may not see how this can come about. We don't see how that God can use us. We may think that we are not educated well enough. We may feel like that we don't have certain uh, oratory gifts or whatever. We may feel like we don't even have the means to get around to share the message. But friends, if, if God has, um, here we go, if God has given us a call and, and the fact that he's called each one of us in some way or another to be a part of this message, then we can go and he will do it. And just to give you a, a little antidote on this, when I was 21, I received a call to the ministry and I went to the brethren and I said, you know, God has given me this call. I, I, he wants me to start preaching and 
And they said, well, that's great. You know, we think that God can use you, but you have to go to the university for four years and get your degree and all these different things. And I said, you know, time is short. And, and I don't know that God has called me to do that. But I believe if he has called me, he will enable me. Now, there's nothing wrong with good education. We need good education, right? But in this case, I believe God had something different for me. And so um, I entered into evangelistic canvassing work, and I was doing co-porter work, learning, to, um, learning how to save souls better, learning how to relate to people better, and yet at the same time doing something very specific, very dynamic, very hands-on to help the people. And I co-ported for four years. And so then I was given a chance to be a pastor after four years um, and went into the pastoral ministry. And I was in the pastoral ministry in the conference. I was a Seventh-day Adventist conference pastor uh, for about two and a half years. And during that time, I began to learn things that some of you folks know. I began to learn that some of our doctrines had been changed and certain things had happened that I just didn't understand before. I didn't, didn't realize these changes had occurred. And I began to speak out against these things. And I had a conference president. He told me, he said, Alan, he says, you know, if you keep speaking like this, we're going to have to fire you. And if we fire you, you'll never preach again. And the, the call of the gospel meant everything to me. But I believe that if God had called me, that he would, he would work out something. But even if I was to never preach again, I was going to stand for the truth. And yet in the last 40 plus years, or around 40 years that I've been working outside of the conference confines, I have preached in almost every state in the United States. I have preached in... Uh, South America, I've been in Africa, I've been in Asia, I've been in Europe, I've been in Australia. God has allowed me to be virtually all over the world. And so I'm just so thankful for that. But I said, hear my Lord, send me. And if you'll say that, he will send you too. Now he sends us though with a focus. And again, that focus is the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus came to, to teach about the Father. He came to teach about himself. And in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, we see here the gospel message is revealed by God through Christ for us. Here he says in Galatians 1, 11 and 12, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul acknowledged that he received the gospel from Jesus Christ, but this gospel, friends, it comes to us from God through Jesus Christ. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1, Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, he calls it here the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. And so here we see that even the revelation, which is a revelation of Christ, was given by God to Christ, who gave it to the angel, who gave it to John, and John gave it to us. And the gospel message, it centers on Jesus Christ. It's about Christ. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 1, and verse 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel, or the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so, as the disciples went forth, as Paul went forth, they were preaching about the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way in his first epistle to, to the church at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. He said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency, excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. We are told that Paul wrote this and came to this conclusion after he had had the experience that you read about in the book of Acts on Mars Hill, 
where he was speaking to those the, those Athenians there about the the God that they ignorantly worshipped. And there she says that he tried to to match reason with reason and logic with logic. And and even though there was some success, it was relatively little. And so he determined on a new course of action. And that was just simply to preach Christ and him crucified. And if we can do that, if we can preach the old rugged cross to people, it will change them. It will make the difference in their lives. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 43, it says, And he said unto them, that is, Jesus said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. So our evangelism, it deals with speaking about the kingdom of God. And in Matthew 24 and verse 14, Jesus speaks of this also. And he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And so we know, friends, that we are here almost at the end of time now. This gospel, it must be finished. We must do this work. And it's the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, he says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Jesus says the time is fulfilled. And he was speaking here, I believe, of that prophecy uh, that uh, that's in Daniel chapter 9. You had the 70 weeks. He had come to the 69th week. The 69th week had ended. They'd come to the 70th week. It's time for this message to go out now. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, it shows us what happens when people accept the message. It says, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning, again, the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And we know in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that when they were baptized, they were added, added unto the church daily, such as those that should be saved. And so, friends, our, our goal in evangelism, please consider this carefully. Our goal in evangelism is not to complement what the other churches are doing. You know, sometimes people have been led to believe that, for instance, the Baptists are to teach grace and Adventists are to teach the law, that we let other people teach certain things and we just teach our, and we focus on our, 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 our specialties, if you please. But friends, our specialty is the gospel. And we are the ones who have the gospel. We have the everlasting gospel. The so-called gospel, the good news that these other churches are teaching, is a false gospel, friends. We need to understand that they are not teaching the truth, and that is why they are part of Babylon today. God calls Catholicism, Babylon the Great, but she is the mother. She is a harlot, and she is the mother of harlots, and she has daughters. And these daughters follow her teachings, her teachings like Sunday sacredness, the doctrine of the Trinity, the uh, immortality of the soul. And God says that they are babbling. Now, we mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 2, that Paul said that he would preach Christ and him crucified. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, there Paul says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. There is something, friends, about the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary that changes lives, that, that, that can stir hearts in such a way that nothing else can. And this is what our focus should be. And if we can focus and preach on Christ and him crucified, it is so vital that Paul says in verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith 
is also vain. If, if we don't preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, our faith is vain. It means nothing. Yes, we have a message today based on Daniel 8, 14, Revelation 14, 6 through 12, and so on, that Christ today is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. The book of Hebrews also elaborates upon this. But there can be no high priestly ministry without the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Christ. And so these are fundamental points. All of these are fundamental points that have to be spoken and, and, and shared with people because we want to change people. You know, there's this idea that we're not supposed to change people. I don't know if you maybe run across this, but especially in America, we, we hear this today. For instance, if American missionaries go to some far off, far off country, we, 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 are, we are told that, it's, that they should not try to change the culture of the people. They should not try to change the teachings and the religion of the people, that, that we don't want to lose the, the, you know, the, the history of these people and we want to have, let them have their heritage. But friends, if their heritage is in Satanism, if their heritage, heritage is in paganism, if it is in spiritualism, we want to, we must change that heritage. That's a wicked heritage. And if it's my heritage, it's wrong. It needs to be changed, you see. And the gospel is designed to change us in the desire of ages. On page 826 in paragraph two, we are told the gospel is to be presented not as a lifeless theory, but as a living force to change the life. God desires that the receivers of his grace shall be witnesses to its power. Oh, friends, that's what we want. We want to present the gospel not as a lifeless theory, but as a life-giving theory full of power. The, the gospel has the power of God in it. And we'll read that verse just right now. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, there Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ, for it is the power, it is the dunamis, the Greek is dunamis, it means explosive power. It is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It says that if we believe, and to believe is simply a verb form of the concept of having faith. To have faith means to believe. They're based upon, um, to, to believe in, in Greek is from a Greek word called pistuo. And, and, and the Greek word to have faith is pistis. And one is simply the noun form and the other is the verb form of the same thing. And so we are to believe, we are to have faith. And God's gospel through Christ is the power that he gives us to salvation. It brings salvation to us. It saves us, friends. Now, if you talk to, again, most so-called evangelical Christians, and if you, if you ask them or if they, if they talk to you about salvation, they may ask you, are you saved? You, know, you might ask them, are they saved? And they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm saved. And when you ask them what they're saved from, Say, well, what are you saved from? You say you're saved. What are you saved from? And they'll say, well, I, I'm, I'm saved from hell. I'm saved from eternal damnation. In other words, they believe that they are saved from the penalty of sins. And true salvation does save us from the penalty of sin, but it does more. It saves us also from the power of sin. It saves us from the power of sin so that we can live victorious lives now. And if our gospel, if our evangelism doesn't reach out to people and, and help them to become overcoming victorious Christians, then it's not the right kind of evangelism. God wants to save us from the power of sin. He wants to save us from the penalty of sin. And finally, when everything is said and done, he will save us from even the presence of sin. And so I like to call them the three Ps. In English, those are the three Ps. The power of sin, the penalty of sin, and the presence of sin. Now let's talk about the announcement 
of peace that God offers through the gospel. Because as we, we, we speak evangelism, you know, we can talk about certain doctrines. We can talk about the doctrine of death, the doctrine of the Sabbath, the law of God, the sanctuary, appropriate to do, needful to do. But, you know, there's people today who have troubled lives and they need peace. They need peace. And of course, peace comes from having our sins forgiven. It comes from knowing God. It comes from knowing that he is in control. And so the gospel is a gospel of peace. We are told in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 15, and that we should have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the good news of peace. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 36, Acts chapter 10, verse 36, it says, The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. And so our peace, it comes from Jesus Christ. And as he was going to leave his disciples, he told them, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so, friends, Jesus offers us peace. He offers us hope. And he tells us to go and share the gospel. Now, how are we to go? Who is to go? In what capacity are we to go? Well, we're probably familiar with the text in Ephesians 4 and verse 11. Ephesians 4 and verse 11. It says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Here are five gifts in four packages, if you please, that God gives. And sometimes these things, they can overlap and work in various, various ways. But he uses apostles. Even today, there are uh, men that God considers apostles. There are prophets. Even today, God gives the gift of prophecy. We know that in the Adventist church, particularly it was manifested in the life and the, and, the, and the ministry of Ellen White, but obviously it hasn't stopped there. There are evangelists, and there are many kinds of evangelists. We'll look at some of them specifically later, but there are medical evangelists. You know, doctors are to be medical evangelists. There are medical mission, mission evangelists. There are many ways we can do evangelistic work. And he uses pastors and teachers. Now, for example, in um, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8, Jesus told his disciples, he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. And so there's a, a medical missionary work that Christ has given to his people we are told in Councils on Health, for example, on page 535 and paragraph 2. She says, I can see in the Lord's providence that the medical missionary work is to be a great entering wedge whereby the diseased soul may be reached. So, Okay, I think we're back. Um, I don't know if, you, if everybody else was gone, but I was gone. And I don't know if I lost connection or you did, but I'm glad to be back. And give me just a second to bring my notes back up that I had that we were sharing on the screen. Okay, there we go. Uh, let's see. Brother Sammy, am I on? Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're Bob. Welcome, Bob. Okay, thank you. Was was I the only one who left? Others get kicked off too. It was only you. 
Okay, I don't know. Maybe I lost my, my internet connection. I, I apologize for that. Um, my screen is different. I'm not sure. Oh, I see. I have to hit share screen. Okay, here we go. Host disabled. I need you to let me share my screen. Okay. Yeah. There we go. That looks better now. Okay, it looks like more like we were earlier. Okay, very good. So the, the medical missionary work is an entering wedge so that we can help with the diseased soul of the person. Also in Testimonies, Volume 6, page 281, again and again, I have been instructed that the medical missionary work is to bear the same relation to the work of the third angel's message that the arm and hand bear to the body. Under the direction of the divine head, they are to work unitedly in preparing the way for the coming of Christ. The right arm of the body of truth is to be constantly active, constantly at work, and God will strengthen it, but it is not to be made the body. At the same time, the body is not to say to the arm, I have no need of thee. The body has need of the arm in order to do active, aggressive work. Both have their appointed work, and each will suffer great loss if worked independently of the other. And if you want an illustration of that, just take your right arm and have someone tied behind your back or just hold it and behind yourself and never use it for a whole day and see how much you can accomplish. It's true. The, the arm is not the body. But friends, you don't do very much with the body without that arm. It's really important. So one of the great ways that we can do evangelism is through medical missionary work. It just opens doors to, to people's hearts and their souls in ways that very few things can. Another way is the literature work. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. You see, friends, God has given us a work of literature, especially in volume 7 of the Testimonies on page 100. 51. There we read, the great object of our publications is to exalt God, to call men's attention to the living truths of his word. God calls upon us to lift up not our own standard, not the standard of the world, but his standard of truth. And so God has called us to, to share the truth, and using literature is one of the great means, and there's various ways to share literature. I don't have time to try to, I mean, that would be a seminar by itself that would be worth time doing. But we we're told this in volume seven of the testimonies on page 140 in paragraph three. She says, and in a large degree through our publishing house houses is to be accomplished the work of that other angel who comes down from heaven with great power and who lightens the earth with his glory. She's speaking of the fourth angel of Revelation 18. And she says, to a great degree, this is how this is going to happen. And friends, there are various personal endeavors that we can do, working just one-on-one -on -one with people, visiting neighbors, helping someone who's sick, taking someone some bread or, or, or some kind of, of helpful thing for them in their need, and just meeting their needs where they're at. There are many ways that we can do evangelistic work. But we have this message, and we are not to water this message down. We are not to try to dilute it in some way to make it seem more acceptable. And in fact, we are to very firmly preach our distinctive doctrines. Yes, we do preach things that the other churches don't, and sometimes we preach things that they consider anathema, things that they don't like, things that they are very much against. But friends, if they call us a cult or a sect, if they, if they speak derogatory toward us, we shouldn't let that bother us. We know that the mainline Adventist church, that they have been courting the favor of the other churches, and they did not want to be looked upon as some kind of a non-Christian organization. But look here, for over 160, 180 almost years, we've been calling them Babylon. We've been calling them Babylon. So why should we be upset if they say something about us? It shouldn't bother us. We just have to go forward and give the work as we have.
been given it. Now I want to talk a little bit about church planning before we close. And this would be a subject that could be really enamorated on a lot by itself, obviously. Um, I believe that the term itself, church planting, is used one time by Ellen White. It's, it's not a, a, a concept that you hear in, in phraseology often, but it's an idea that she has. But I want to talk about the foundation of planting churches. The real foundation of preparing churches begins in our homes, friends. And I cannot emphasize this enough, that the first church is the church in your home. And if we, if we want to go out and we want to, quote, plant churches, if we want to start churches in new cities and new areas, we need to make sure that God has helped us to establish a church in our home and have an efficient working home church first. Because without that, it'll be very difficult to go forward. I'd just like to share a few statements on this. This first one's in Letters and Manuscripts, number 25. It was written in 1910 by Ellen White. It's paragraph eight. It says, the, the history of everyone is written in the books of heaven that all may know that their reward or punishment is according to their works, their service in this life. Let parents remember that every day makes part of their history and that no neglect must be permitted in the home because they cannot know how soon sickness and death may come to them or to their children. And so friends, we need to establish good homes and have the truth in these homes. In the same um, manuscript, the next paragraph, paragraph nine says, in the home church, children are to learn to pray and to trust in God. They are to learn that they are to prepare <clears throat> to become members of the family of heaven and that they must, therefore, be kind and dutiful to their parents, faithfully respecting their wishes. So we, do, we shouldn't think, friends, that we need to have a church to send our children to, to learn about God, to learn to pray. That happens in our home church first. The father, we are told, continuing in this same uh, manuscript, the next paragraph, the father and mother should work together in full sympathy with each other. They should make themselves companions to their children. And then I have a, another quotation I've broken up in two slides so that we can see it earlier, easier. This is from pamphlet 38, paragraph one. It says, and when they had fastened, fast, fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And uh, she, she's speaking here, of course, the disciples says, they went to their appointed field of labor. The laborers moved under divine authority. These men must know for themselves the best fields in which to work. Some men can work better when, when they can be with their families. The home church may need the influence of a God-fearing father who disciplines and trains his children aright. God would not have men ruthlessly sent to fields far away from their families. Some without families can go more conveniently to distant fields, letting the fathers remain with their families. In sending Christian workers from post to post, let the fathers and mothers be consulted before the field is appointed. The home family flock is not to be left distressed for the want of a father's judicious influence. So in this, if, if we're thinking about going out, we would like to start a church in, in, in a neighboring city or somewhere, even perhaps very far off. And we're going to send a worker over there to do that. She says, don't send a worker over there who has a father, who's a father with children at home who may need that influence at home. Send someone who, who, who's maybe not married or send someone who's married without children, they say, the principle that's involved here. This next statement is from 19 Letters and Manuscripts, letter uh, 33, 1904, paragraph 16. God calls upon believers to cease finding fault, to cease making hasty, unkind speeches. Parents, let the words that you speak to your children be kind and pleasant that angels may have your help in drawing them to Christ. A thorough reformation is needed in the home church. Where at? In the home church. Let it begin at once. Let all grumbling and fretting and scolding cease. 
those who fret and scold shut out the angels of heaven and open the door to evil angels. Oh, friends, that should make us wake up. Let the husband and wife remember that they have burdens enough to carry without making their lives wretched by allowing differences to come in. Those who give place to little differences invite Satan into their homes. And again, remember, the first church that we need to plant is the home church. From Letters and Manuscripts 23, Manuscript 7, 1908, in paragraph 7. A very different class of education from that which has prevailed in the past needs to be given to our youth. And this work should begin in the home. Let me just pause here for a minute. You know, Ellen White wrote a lot about the youth. We used to have a magazine in, in the denomination called The Youth Instructor, designed to help young people. Today, we see young people leaving the movement, leaving the, quote, church, end quote, in droves. It, we, we see very few of the young people stay with things because, for instance, we have not trained them. We have not taught them to make good decisions. We have not made the gospel beautiful to them. We have not made living as Christians in so inviting that they want to continue that in their lives. But this work is to begin in the home. There are many parents who need to awake and be converted. Both parents and children have a special work to do for their home church. But before we can have a model church, we must have model homes. Let every family mark on the doorposts that the blood of Jesus Christ is their safeguard. When lives of consecrated and when lives of consecration and obedience are lived in the homes of our people, the results will be seen in a perfect church. So, friends, we need to invest time to truly plant a church and raise it up. But that first church needs to be our home church. Now, when we think about working in churches, maybe outside of our home. I'm going to compare this to a garden. If we were going to have a garden and have some crops, the seed must be sown first. But even after the plants have broken the soil and are starting to grow, they still need cared for. They need cared for all the way to a time we have fruit. And so when we're thinking of going out or assigning men to go out to, to maybe raise up a church, this doesn't mean that they go out and preach for four or five weeks and have evangelistic meetings, raise up a church, and then they necessarily should leave at that point. Sometimes raising up a church takes time, and we need to incorporate the planning of time into the, in the planning of raising up churches. As an example, in Acts chapter 18, verses 8 through 11, it says, And Crispus the chief ruler of the synagogue believed in the Lord with all of his house and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So Paul went to Corinth and he began to preach. It says then in verse nine, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by vision, be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace for I am with thee and no man shall set on, set on thee to hurt thee for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. The Apostle Paul spent 18 months teaching these people in Corinth after there were some believers. Some people come together and they believed. And so Paul spent time with them in Acts chapter 20, verses 2 and 3. It says, And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sell to Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And so here it speaks about Paul being in Greece for three months. He didn't just go for two or three weeks at a time or a few days. He spent time. Now, when we read the book of Acts, we're reading a very condensed history of the Christian church, early Christian church. Very, very condensed. And sometimes because it seems to, in, in just a few chapters, list a lot of Paul's different places he visited, we get the, maybe the idea that, that he didn't stay very long in these places. But I want you to consider that w when you study the, 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 the journeys of Paul out and put them on a timeline as best we can understand, Paul's first journey started around in the year AD 45 and lasted till AD 49. 
In other words, his first missionary journey was somewhere between three and four years. His second journey uh, started in 49 and ended in 52, so somewhere between three and four years. And then his third missionary journey went from 52 to 57. And so that was a, a time of four to five years. So we need to understand, despite the fact that we believe that we're living on the very edge of, eternal, of, of eternity and that we don't have much time left, church planning takes time. And, and we just can't expect it to happen overnight. We need to dedicate workers to this project and they need to dedicate themselves to it. And yes, if we can do it fast, let's do it as fast as we can, absolutely, and do more. But don't be surprised if it takes time. It takes time to establish churches. In the Review and Herald of January 14, 1868, in paragraph four, we are told the greatest cause of our spiritual feebleness as a people is the lack of real faith in spiritual gifts. If they all received this kind of testimony in full faith, they would put from them those things which displease God and would everywhere stand in union and in strength. And three-fourths of the ministerial labor now expended to help the churches could then be spared to the work of raising up churches in new fields. And so, friends, we need to... We need to help the already established churches to be strong so that they can then function on themselves without that evangelist, and he can go somewhere else. And so the evangelist and the pastor, they, they, are, they need to prepare the people to stand on their own. As a parent, a parent has many responsibilities in raising a child. And, and I've tried to think because I, 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 I'm, I was a father and I had three children. I had two boys and a girl. And um, sadly, uh, both my boys died. I, I had a son die when he was 14 months old. I had a son die when he was 25 years old. And I still have a daughter. She's 37 years old now. And so she's long since out of my house. But as I was raising the children, and, and, and asking God to help me to know what to do. I tried to understand in the most simplistic way what it means to be a parent and what the duty of a parent is. And fundamentally, I came up with this one thing. My responsibility as a parent was to train my children to live without me. To train my children to live without me. Physically, where they could produce for themselves, make a living, have their own place to live, have food to eat, have transportation, those kind of things. One of my responsibilities was to train them to be able to do this or to provide training for them. I was to train them emotionally, how to deal with things in everyday life, but most importantly, I was to train them spiritually so that if I am not around, they can not only survive but prosper spiritually. That is the responsibility of a parent. You know, we, we see sometimes, at least in America we do, we see a situation where parents want to hold on to their children forever. They don't want the children to leave home. They want them to maybe set up household in their own homes or in a house right beside their house. And they never want to let go of their children. And the children are always dependent upon the parents. They need money from the parents. They need this from the parents. They need this support from the parents. But friends, we should be teaching our children to live without us. And the churches, they should be taught to live without the evangelist. <laughs> they should be taught how to live on their own, to, to be successful on their own, because they have been established in Christ and they're looking to him now and not to the evangelist. And you know, we have a big work before us, friends, and I know my time is, is about up and I need to, to close. But before I do that, I want to appeal to you that God has a great work for us and we are a small group. Those of us who believe this truth about God and, and believe that God has called us to a restoration of the true three angels' messages and to do this work, we are a motley little crew. We are a small crew. We, we don't have the resources that the big church has. We don't have the universities the big church has. We don't have all these facilities 
the big church has. But I want to close with this thought from Christ Optic Lessons, page 333 in paragraph one. It says, as the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enablings. All his biddings are enablings. Christ's Object Lessons, page 333, paragraph 1. And so, my beloved, God has bidden us to go forth, to evangelize, to bring this good news of the kingdom of God, this good news of forgiveness of sins, this good news of restoration through the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. He has brought peace to us, and it is our responsibility to bring this to others. And he will help us. He will enable us. We, we may not have many talents. It doesn't matter. The talents are given by God. And if we will use what he gives us, he will give us more and enable us to continue to share the good news with others. I want to thank you so much uh, for the opportunity that you've given me to, to meet with you today. Um, if there is um, any questions or comments anyone would like to share, I'm open if that's in the time, Brother um, Wilberforce, um, whatever we are to do at this point, I open, turn it back to you.